I also wanted to mention that February 18th coming up is KU's university-wide crowdsourced fundraising day, one day, one KU. It's a very important day for us. Um, this year, we're hoping to raise funds to help maintain uh, excellence at the museum that you've come to expect, such as uh, unique exhibits like the Paleo Garden uh, and the care of our uh, live snakes and lizards and more. We're also raising funds for our student positions. Um, we have fabulous students that work at the museum, not just in uh, uh, graduate research, but a variety of majors working in different fields, gaining valuable experience, but also contributing their fantastic talents and voices. Uh, Last, uh, this is a really exciting announcement for everybody. It'll be a little while before the statues are able to be placed atop Dyke Hall, and we want you to be able to see them uh, in person and up close. Uh, when we are open again, um, we are thrilled to announce that the grotesques will be on display along with items and information um, about the artists, the architects, the processes involved. Um, this display, this exhibit should be completed uh, at the beginning of March. Um, we're still not quite sure when we'll be able to open our doors yet, but we're excited that uh, you'll be able to see them up close and in person. All right, um, let's get started. I would like to welcome um, our guests this evening, including, um, uh, <laughs> sorry, the artists Laura and Carl Ramberg and uh, Amy and Keith Vandery, who are project partners from uh, the KU Department of Architecture. And we're gonna lead off with a presentation from our director emeritus, Leonard Christ Christalka. Thank you very much. Um, I'm oh. also gonna do a share screen. So, uh, uh, but before I do that, uh, it's really a privilege and an honor for me to be presenting uh, uh, the grotesque for the first time to our members and members of the public the friends of the museum who have supported us for so many years. And I encourage you to come see them in the museum when you can, uh, when it's open again, uh, up close and personal. Whoops, sorry. One moment. There we go. Good. Can everybody see this? And? Yes. Great. Perfect. So uh, go back to 1903, 1901 to 1903. Dyke Hall um, has uh, uh, just been constructed. And you can see the finishing touches being put on uh, the brand new Natural History Museum. Uh, on the campus of uh, the University of Kansas. When the architects uh, uh, designed the building, they decided that there would be 12 edicules, which is a fancy name for pedestal altars. And these pedestal altars would have on them 12 grotesques, four on the east face of, uh, and the front face, of uh, Dyke Hall, four on the south face, and four on the north face. And these uh, edicules would honor uh, famous natural historians uh, of the time. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as it was common in that time, none of them uh, are women and of course should have been. So, uh, the person chosen to carve and, and sculpt the 12 grotesques for the altars was an individual named Joseph Frazee, uh, who was a master uh, carver who had done work in New York. He was trained by his father and uh, also in Kansas City um, uh, all, uh, uh, with uh, adorning many of the famous buildings uh, in Kansas City and perhaps even throughout uh, uh, parts of the rest of Kansas. The stones that Frazee is carving here 
And this is probably from about 1902. We only have two photographs of Frazee carving uh, the stones. These are from uh, the lower cottonwood limestone, appropriately enough, a Kansas uh, limestone. There's Joseph Frazee. And when this photograph was taken, he had already completed like what we're calling the cat, the lion, although we're going to have a discussion about whether it truly is a lion or not, the calf, the dog, the zebra, and the notations E, N, uh, S, and W, uh, sorry, E, N, and S refer to uh, the northeast and um, south sides of the museum, and the numbers uh, are the numbers along uh, the roof line that these grotesques occupy. We don't know what those two ended up being. A later photograph where a much greater amount of progress has already been made. There's Joseph Frazee working with his son Vitruvius Frazee in carving the 12 grotesques. Nine have been completed the ram on the north side, the zebra on the south side, the dog on the south side, the lion, so-called, we've always assumed it was a lion on the south side. And this one is a lion because it has claws. The calf on the north side, the cat on the east side, on the north side, a grotesque uh, that we, we don't really know what it is. We've never seen it. Others saw it, but uh, as I'll explain later on, this grotesque was stolen and there's another mystery novel to be written. And the ape on the east side. So nine are complete. Frazee himself is just finished, the bat dragon. We're not sure if it's a bat or a dragon, uh, the artists, uh, Laura, Laura Ramberg and, and Carl Ramberg think it's a bat, uh, and I'll go with that. And of course, notice it has one of the KU emblems. Vitruvius Frazee is working on the next grotesque, finishing it up. We think it'll end up being the lion, another lion. We've always called it the lion and it has the Kansas uh, pendant. But check out the anatomy of this lion. It doesn't have claws. It has a hoof, it has two hoofs uh, in, the, in, the front fore, in the forelegs. So it could be a poorly carved sheep that looks like a lion or a play on, um, uh, uh, a legend of a lion in sheep's clothing, that uh, which one of the artists, uh, Laura Ramberg, has suggested. In Frazee's head, still to be carved, is the elephant. Oh, I wonder if this is blocking it. Um, which has rock chalk on it and the date 1873, oops, it's frozen. And the rhino with a uh, emblem Jayhawk question mark. Sorry, I seem to have somehow frozen the presentation. Hmm. Bear with me. So four grotesques on the east side, the cat, the dragon or bat, the ape, and the rhino, 
which has the Jayhawk question mark uh, emblem on it. On the north side, the lion with the hooves, the ram, the calf, and uh, the grotesque that was stolen, which I'll be talking about in a moment. Notice the hoof on the lion, and of course the hooves on the ram calf, and uh, what we think might be a goat uh, and the stolen grotesques. So is this a lion in sheep's clothing? On the south side, there are four grotesques, the lion with claws, the elephant, rock chalk, the dog, and the zebra. These stood on Dyke Hall from 1903 until 1917. If you're wondering about the motif, why these animals, uh, why these grotesques, some of them appear to uh, uh, be popular in uh, grotesque lore. Here's the Notre Dame Cathedral with its elephant, and of course the rock chalk elephant on top of Dyke Hall. In 1963, a wing, a new wing was added to Dyke Hall, uh, causing and necessitating the removal of the grotesques that were on the roof line uh, along the north side. So, the lion with the hooves, or the sheep in, or the lion in sheep's clothing, the ram, the calf, and what we think might be the goat, uh, had to come down. They were stored temporarily in a building on West Campus, uh, before West Campus was as developed as it is now. And it was at that time that one of these four disappeared mysteriously and that's uh, the one that's labeled N12 goat stolen. Why were they taken down in 1917? In, sorry, in 2017. Um, just a quick illustration of the amount of erosion that has occurred uh, in the years since they were uh, put up on the roof line in uh, 1903. the terrific amount of erosion of this uh, limestone. And the film you will see after this presentation, uh, you'll also uh, be able to see the, the amount of erosion that many of the grotesques suffered. So they, we decided to take them down to preserve them for history because they are a unique animal um, uh, mythology. Um, that uh, is unique to Kansas, it's unique to the University of Kansas. Indeed, it's, the, it's unique uh, in the United States. It's a, a unique cultural heritage that uh, we decided must be preserved. And we also decided it should be recreated. So uh, here's the scaffolding against the south side of Dyke Hall in, I think it's late 2017. with the uh, workmen uh, loosening the uh, grotesques from their moorings and building boxes around them. Before that, covering them over with cellophane for protection and packing. There's the elephant all packed up and boxed up. And moved by crane lower down to the on Jayhawk Boulevard to a truck and placed in the truck, driven to the garage and each of the cartons were there and each of the uh, wooden containers were taken into the panorama gallery and unpacked. One of the unpackers that we were so happy could be there at the time was Cheryl Burdett, who is the granddaughter of the original carver, Joseph Frazee. And working with her is Laurie Schlenker, who led and managed the entire grotesque project from beginning to end. 
So what do these grotesques uh, stand for? Well, um, let's look ar around at other buildings that have grotesque and gargoyles. And by the way, the difference between the two is gargoyles um, have their mouths open and uh, they are meant to carry water through them as opposed to grotesques, uh, which do not. Here are the gargoyles over one of the facades of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Quite stunning. What were they for? Why do so many of the churches, as well as government buildings uh, in Europe, uh, have these gargoyles and grotesques? We think it's uh, they are guardians of the sacred world to allow the, the worship and uh, the divinities to go on inside the buildings and to protect them uh, from oh, uh, the devil on the outside. So perhaps it was the same motivation for Dyke Hall that inspired uh, the idea between the architect and, and Joseph Frizi, and that is to carve 12 grotesques and put them up along the east, the north, and the south faces of Dyke Hall to be guardians of the natural world and guard all of the work that goes on in the Natural History Museum. And there may be more to it than this. Uh, Lewis Lindsay Dyke, who was a, a very famous uh, uh, naturalist explorer, uh, was convinced uh, even in 1903 that Kansas and much of the rest of the environment was already suffering greatly from uh, the extinction of biodiversity, that species were disappearing under his very nose. And he should know because he mounted many expeditions uh, uh, around uh, uh, North America. So in many ways, it could be, we don't know because there is no paper record left of what the, either the, uh, the sculptor Joseph Frazee was thinking or what Lewis Lindsay Dyke was thinking, but it is possible that they were um, meaning for the grotesque to be guardians of the natural world, not only in terms of the research that was and teaching that was going on in the museum, but also in guardians of the natural world around, around the world and a guardian against the further exploitation and extinction of species. The grotesque renewal project involved the uh, removal and uh, the renewal, the recarving of eight of the 12 original grotesques, the ones on the east face and the ones on the south face. Our artists that were um, uh, hired to do this are Lawrence artists, uh, Laura Ramberg and Carl Ramberg. And here they are um, measuring uh, the zebra, which I think was the first one that they started on. And you can see in the zebra, all the erosion on uh, one of the legs. Laura and Carl were joined by Keith Vanderiet and Amy Vanderiet from Architecture and Design, who were going to do 3D uh, scanning and 3D modeling of the grotesques. We set up a, a fenced uh, enclosure beside Dyke Hall uh, for uh, Carl Ramberg to rough out uh, the blocks of uh, uh, limestone, cottonwood limestone. And um, he would do the roughing out. And you can see the beginning block and the roughed out block. The roughed out block would then be transported north of Lawrence to Laura Ramberg's studio uh, where she would uh, finish the uh, sculpting uh, and carving of the grotesques. We also, because of uh, Carl and, and, and Laura and Keith and Amy, 
involved uh, students from architecture and design in the carving and in the 3D scanning. Laura produced uh, maquettes of, of each of the eight grotesques, often of the entire uh, grotesque as well as the head. The first five are the zebra, the dog, the lion, the ape, and the cat. In Laura's studio, north of Lawrence, you can see the maquette being a model uh, for the almost finished uh, dragon, bat. And the terrific drawings that she did with exacting measurements to make sure that the new grotesques would be faithful to the old grotesques. These drawings and the new grotesques will, and the maquettes will be part of the display uh, for the public to see in the museum when it is open again. They were all completed in November of uh, 2020. Uh, and so let's just review uh, and reveal uh, the gorgeous, uh, stunning, new grotesques, the zebra, the dog, the elephant. Notice you can actually read the rock chalk and it is 1873, we think in honor of uh, the first graduating class from the University of Kansas. The lion, this lion with the claws, the real lion, the rhino, the ape, the bat, dragon, and the cat. I'm going to go through each one of these and show a full front view, uh, a headshot, and a side view. Starting with the zebra. The dog. You can see the dog growling. The rock chalk elephant. The lion with the claws, the real lion. The rhinoceros, mm -hmm. appropriately got his horn back. And here is the new rhino facing off against the old rhino on the sixth floor of Dyke Hall as the new rhino was being wheeled in. The ape with this wonderful, wonderful grin that Laura managed to capture. The bat dragon with the KU emblem. Notice that the ear on the bat dragon is in the shape of a seahorse. We don't know why. The cat. Rock 
Marchok, Jayhawk, KU. And there are the stars, the truly magnificent artists uh, who brought the new grotesques to life from stone. Laura Ramberg, Carl Ramberg. And you will have the incredible honor and privilege of speaking with them uh, when this presentation is done. And this is Lori Schlenker holding up the Kansas Preservation Alliance Award uh, for excellence uh, that the uh, Natural History Museum received for this grotesque renewal project. We're really proud of uh, this award and we're extremely proud of Lori Schlenker who managed and organized the, the project from beginning to end. Thank you very much. That ends this part of the presentation, which, and now I believe we'll see the film. Yeah, I uh, just wanna introduce, thank you, Chris, so much. Um, I wanna just introduce this video. KU Marketing Communications um, has some incredibly talented staff and they've been documenting the process all the way through. And um, we're going to show, uh, Anne's gonna, uh, Lubin's gonna queue up a video that uh, they completed. Um, and there's lots more footage we'll be sharing, but um, this is a really special video uh, that they produced. This video is not available online right now, but it will be available next week for you to share from KU's accounts. Um, Anne? And then we will, um, one last thing, um, use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the bottom far right um, to, answer, to um, pose questions. And then we're gonna um, start taking questions from our special guest today, thanks. The grotesques have been uh, on the building since 1903 for 118 years. It was obvious uh, how much erosion had occurred. So we decided to take them down to preserve them for history. And we received uh, proposals for re-sculpting the grotesques. They knew they had to replicate them to restore the facade because they had already undertaken the uh, restoration project on, on the facade of the whole building. The original carvings were made out of cottonwood limestone and even the fact that we reused the same type of limestone was very important to the project. Limestone, you know, the material itself is millions and millions of years old. And it's the deposition of life itself. I mean, it is bones and shells. It's one big chunk of bones and shells. My job is, is to rough them out. What you see, what I carve is, is kind of chunky and blocky. And, uh, and that's done on purpose, you know. And then as you go in, you facet it a little bit and pretty soon you're getting all the curves and, and, and all the detail in. You can take more off, but you can't put it back on. <laughs> it was uh, a little daunting to say the least. We put in our proposal and I think one of the things that made our proposal stand out is that we wanted to do a lot of outreach in the carving process. And that's a little why I set up right here in front of the museum. It's students and faculty. Now they drive by and they, oh, hey, Carl, what's up? You know, and a, a kindred spirits, I think. The truth is there's only one sculptor. You can have any number of helpers, but there's one person, 
and that person is Laura, that, that these are her pieces that, that she is putting her, her soul into, and, uh, and any help that I can give her, that's the help I'm trying to give her. I knew like two things when I was a little girl. I knew I loved horses and, uh, and that I wanted to be an artist. But it wasn't until uh, I came to KU and took a sculpting class. The teacher, Spoko Fraser, said, uh, you know, I think you could be a great sculptor. And I said, what? <laughs> They take a long time to carve, so I have a long time to be thinking about things. Maybe I'm thinking of stories, maybe I'm thinking of other works of art, maybe I'm just thinking of um, the attitude of a lion, how it sits. It's almost as if these things are alive and move around a little bit. <laughs> I use an air hammer, so I liken it to uh, Bob Dylan plugging in. You're still making music by hand. It's just a different instrument. It's been very helpful to get a scale model. So there was some 3D imaging and a 3D print made, and it was made at one quarter scale. There must be a way that we can do this that's cheaper. There must be a way that's easier and more accessible. And so I got into the idea of photogrammetry, which is like 3D scanning based off of photos, using multiple photos, and then 3D printing. Now we have an exact replication of it. So we would do the scan of an object, 3D print it, and then make a silicone mold and then cast plaster in it for these replicated details. Cottonwood limestone carries very specific fossils that are, are sort of a signature to this region. And those fossils show uh, and express themselves in different ways in the stone. And so choosing that is also, again, symbolic about Kansas and the kind of limestone that we mine here, the kind of animals that lived here millions of years ago, which ultimately feeds into what the museum does. In some areas, like in some of these, when you look at them, they'll be missing kind of a layer of Keith and I, yeah, we're both KU alums, and I actually remember very, very distinctly thinking how beautiful Dyke Hall was when I was a student here. I just remember thinking that it was just an inspiring building in so many ways, and the stone carving was so beautiful. And I remember looking at the grotesque and wanting to figure out their meaning even then. So to come back 20 years later and get to work on this project, and as I pitched it to the students, you know, this is going to be the project that when your children come here, you're going to point to the grotesque and say, that's what I worked on when I was a student. And you'll always have a connection to this building. There's no question that Lewis Lindsay Dyke, who was uh, after whom the building is named, was passionate even back in 1903 about conserving the animals and plants and the biodiversity on Earth. And I think the grotesques are a symbol of the sanctity and the guarding of that knowledge for the future. What I think Laura and Carl have done is uh, create what will become and what in fact is now a unique cultural, a new unique cultural treasure for the country, for Kansas, and for the university. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, if we can get the panelists to come up, I think oh. if we
we can get the panelist uh, cameras up and then I think we'll take some questions. Um, remember to use the Q&A feature at the bottom far right. Um, I've called a couple questions from the chat as well, but if you can use the Q&A feature, that's helpful. And um, I'm gonna just kick off one of the questions, um, which uh, I know has an interesting um, thing behind it here. And, um, uh, and also I believe Sarah Lynn had one. I'm gonna ask, um, so we have Keith and Amy Vandery from the Department of Architecture and the artist, Laura. Hi, Laura and Carl Ramberg here. And, um, and, and Chris, Chris Schalke. And uh, first qu question we had was, um, I think, uh, was will there be a protective coating put on the new grotesque to prevent erosion? And um, I thought you might be able to address the limestone and, and what sections of the limestone, how, what was different about this? There, uh, we, we don't recommend uh, putting coatings on uh, limestone. Uh, one of the main reasons is that they don't last. Uh, one of the, uh, when they've done coatings in the past, the problems have been that it traps moisture inside the stone. And so uh, the best uh, uh, advice is to leave them as they are. Okay. Right. Uh, stone experts have told us and preservationists have told us that the stone needs to breathe, which is uh, exactly what Carl uh, was saying. Basically what I was trying to say. Right. Okay. And um, another uh, question is, does anybody know why there is a question mark? No. Okay, another of the mysteries. Um, here's a question from Laura's granddaughter, Hazel, and she wants to know which one is your favorite grandma, Laura? And I'm gonna put a PS on that one uh, and say, can you tell us a little bit about the nicknames? Um, I would, as far as the, my favorite one, it's always the one I'm working on, right? And, um, I think I, I'm fond of the elephant and the rhinoceros. I think those are my two favorites. Hi, Hazel. I'm, I'm real fond of Hazel. Yeah. <laughs> well, Laura, did you, give, did you give them some nicknames? I, I did not um, so much give them nicknames, although at one point, I think the elephant turned into the um, the Indian god Ganesh. Hey. And uh, that was uh, my nickname for the, the statue and later my nickname for my air hammer. <laughs> oh. as Ganesh is the remover of obstacles. I, I started giving them names right from the start. Yeah. And so the first one, the zebra, it just seemed like the most beautiful one of all. And so I thought of what uh, is the most beautiful thing and, and all I could think, well, that'd be my girlfriend, Denise. And so the first one I called Denise. Uh, the second one kind of seemed like it had a snarly grin. And so I called him Snarly. Uh, what was after that? The elephant. The elephant mm -hmm. was Ganesh. Ganesh. Ganesh and... Uh, after that, the lion, I thought, was our leader with lots of hair, and that would be Chris. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, the rhinoceros, uh, I think I called Spike. You call them horny. <laughs> I, did, I know, but that's inappropriate to call him horny. Uh, the, uh, the ape, uh, I thought, was... Uh, what, what is the ape way up high? It would be King Kong, but this is clearly a female ape. And so it's Queen Kong. And uh, what's after that one? I forget after that. Uh, and uh, the, the dragon, the only name I could come up with a dragon was Puff from my childhood, Puff the Magic Dragon. And uh, the last one, was I started in March 
of uh, 2020 when there was, I, I still had a little hope and I called it Bernie. Okay, um, <clears throat> a couple people have said, how long did it take on average to carve each one? Well, in anticipating this question, I looked back through my notes this evening and found uh, that the rhino took around 165 hours over a period of eight weeks. And that and was af after I had spent probably 40 to 50 hours on it. And, and that was typical for all of them. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I, I also, uh, it was important for me to pace myself because there were several of them to do. So uh, my days weren't that long, but they were very focused and, and uh, labor intensive. So I would work from four, four to six hours of carving. And uh, so I would have energy to carve the next day. I also had to change my diet a little bit and I was taking in more protein and um, just had to treat myself like an athlete. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, sorry, let's see here. Oh, somebody asked, um, I noticed a tile pattern on some of the grotesques, was that how the originals were? And is it, or is it simply decorative? And is it simply decorative or is there another reason for that? It's a, um, it was the texture that was on the originals. And if you look carefully, there's a lot of um, degradation, a lot of aging on the original uh, carvings. But uh, the ones that were taken down on the north side for the annex are a little bit more preserved because they were taken off in 1960 something, um, whereas the others uh, were out in the weather much longer. So, um, what was what was the question? Again? Well, this was this was one of the issues that. Uh, Took us took us oh, a long texture. time of getting getting the texture to be uh, as close to the originals as we could, and, and and the first one or two wasn't weren't as uh, close as we had hoped, and Laura went back and worked on those more in the end, and uh, but uh, it, it is an attempt to recreate the. The original and texture. One one of the there. things that I learned from this was that the texture uh, made the shadows work a whole lot better when you looked at them from fifty feet away. That uh, the uh, without the the texture, when Laura had them just kind of smooth, when she got had them first cart, when you looked fifty feet away, the shadows didn't weren't as intense and the textures brought that out. So it's like if you were advertising or making a poster that um, as opposed to a work of art that you look very carefully and, and are next to, but this poster is across the room and it's made with big black marks and red letters and it's it has to be like that. It's kind of, um, a way to um, create big, big gestures and mm -hmm. something that can be seen from a distance. Okay, great. Um, here we have a question from Maddie Carr. Hi, Carl and Laura. This is Maddie. I was lucky enough. Uh, just, uh, I was lucky enough to help with the carving. Could you talk about traditional stone carving today and how you see stone carving being passed down to future generations? Why has this process stood the test of time? This is uh, part of what I've been trying to uh, do um, uh, to 
to uh, the, an idea that I've been trying to throw out there in the world. Stone carving was a fundamental part of architecture from the very beginnings that we recognize the earliest architecture because there were stone carvings in that cave. And stone carving has been a part of uh, architecture and cultures all across the world. And then in the 20th century, the modern aesthetic for architecture all but eliminated stone carving. And my feeling is, is that stone carving has always had carried part of the spiritual quality of architecture. And this is one of the things that might be missing from architecture today. And if we could bring stone carving back into the world and make it a part, once again, an ingredient of architecture, this is my dream. Uh, as far as methods, I, I continue to, to use uh, uh, hand tools, and I do that mostly because of my teacher, Eldon Teft, that uh, this is how he taught me. And uh, when he died, I felt like he handed something over to me that I needed to carry on. Uh. I love stone carving. <laughs> there you have it. I would just add one thing to that, that, um, you know, when there was a, a movement in Italy called the slow, slow food movement, and it was in reaction to the fast food here in America and the kind of cheapness of a meal that we've all become accustomed to. And they believed that there was a better quality to slowing down and eating and sharing the food and, and talking during a meal. And, I think for me, stone carving is a little bit like slowing down and, and bringing the quality back into and, and the meaning into architecture and the details of architecture. And it's only through that slow process that, that you sort of dwell on things long enough to add meaning and add layers to it for others to discover over time. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> how We have a couple more questions about the limestone itself and, and, and um... The, the legacy of this, um, how long do you think these will last? And are there backups in, ca in, in case anything major happens to these amazing creatures? Uh, and also where in Kansas is the limestone sourced? The limestone is called Cottonwood Limestone. It's quarried down near Cottonwood Falls, Strong City in that uh, neck of the woods and, and has been quarried there for over 100 and 30, 40 years. Um, it's the same stone that the Douglas County Courthouse and any uh, number of uh, buildings on campus, but it's also uh, three, three wings of the State House in Topeka are, are made of this stone. Uh, they started out in the East Wing using a stone from Junction City, but then they switched to Cottonwood and uh, they uh, dig the stone up from uh, down there in the quarry and bring it up to stone yards. This particular, where we got it was a stone yard in Topeka, Lardner Stone, who Laura and I have both worked for that stone yard as carvers uh, and, and uh, they're dear friends of ours. Uh, but how long will it last? The, the stone is, uh, the ledge is about 30 to 36 inches thick. On the upper ledge, it's full of porosity. And the lower ledge is much more refined and, and tighter grain. You'd think that's what we would want, that tighter grain. But what has been shown is that upper ledge with the porosity lasts longer. And so we did a compromise with this stone. We, we utilized the middle of that ledge and so that we had a tighter grain, but we had it so that, uh, that it, would, it would hopefully last longer. Um, 
the biggest problem with limestone is uh, acid rain because it's uh, very affected by uh, acids. And uh, that is certainly uh, shown by the grotesques that were taken off in 1960, the deterioration with them uh, compared to the ones that were taken off uh, here more recently. Um, and the, how long will they last? Forever, that's what I hope. But uh, <laughs> my guess is yeah. that that uh, I'm not going to be around when they when there's a problem with them. We we hope there there are architects and sculptors in the future that will will mm -hmm. replace them and and re. What I'm what I'm hoping them. is that the next time they are carved, that. It is people carving them and not robots. So part of this project being a, a preservation project, it's also about preserving these types of crafts like stoneworking and masonry. So if we choose to move um, away from that and, and, and do a project and take away the crafts people from the project, then we're also taking away the opportunity to propel that into the future. So in some ways, I want to say these will last forever, because as long as we continually teach and build upon the, the knowledge of everyone involved with it, then we can always make the replicated versions of these in the same manner, and everyone can always be a part of this project. So I think it's just having uh, Carl and Laura being a part of this is just the most incredible experience ever. And I'm so glad that we had an opportunity to work with you and the students got to work with you because that was really the, the most meaningful thing in this project was that connection of people working on a project together that again, that we teach the next generation, you know, this is the way that we want to have, you know, projects done in the future. So they know to do that. The short answer is <laughs> at least a hundred years if they keep the water from dripping on them. Fair enough. <laughs> Um, Ann Patterson has a question. If, if you were to make a new grotesque, what animal would you carve? I would carve one like Ann Patterson. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Ann. <laughs> oh, um, let me think. I don't know. Amy, what do you, what do you think? I, I don't know. I have a hard time with the, I call it the 13th grotesque, that we'd have this 13th grotesque made someday. There are no birds up there or fish. Prairie dog. <laughs> so that's an interesting question, and uh, great to talk to you again. Um, there was a very early suggestion uh, for an interesting conversation that given that this was now the 21st century, that um, we shouldn't just replicate the historic grotesques but that we should design, develop, think about that the artists would come up with a whole new artistic um, animal menagerie um, using 21st century methods and thoughts and philosophies um, for a whole new 21st century symbolism of uh, uh, guarding the life of the planet that the grotesques are supposed to do. Um, but we decided for uh, historic reasons to, um, uh, to be faithful to the historic grotesques. Um, but it's an interesting thought. What would, what would a, a, a different conception of their grotesques be like, uh, if, say, if it were held out to our artistic competition for the 21st century? And these, I think these designs can be... Um interpreted in different ways. I know um, as a scientist, you like to identify things and pin them down and measure them. And, and I do a lot of the same as an artist, but um, I've noticed, you know, that some people think this, you know, oh, that's a zebra. Others may see it as a horse. A child may look at it and, and find a unicorn there, who knows? Um, so people do have bring something to uh, the relationship when they see these 
animals. And um, so the dog may become a wolf or it's, I, and I like that fluidity. I like that um, the one, way they change, they can change. One of the things that as we were carving really struck me was that uh, when the next time that they need to carve these, will the animals depicted still be here? Be here. And uh, it's, it's uncertain, you know, particularly that it really struck me when we were doing the rhino, that uh, yeah. is the rhino still going to be here? or will it just be something in the past? And, uh, uh, you know, so much of uh, what this, these carvings for me were is uh, celebrating the animals themselves. And uh, it's, it's unclear uh, how well we, we are doing as far as uh, ensuring that they they will be here a hundred years from now. There were, that's a, that's a, a beautiful point. Um, indeed, the uh, rhinos are on the endangered species list. There are five species or subspecies and um, uh, many of their predictions are that at the current rate of extinction, they will be gone by 2030, 2040. Uh, and with some of them even earlier, the black rhino, the white rhino especially. Um, there have also been illusions that uh, um, the, the fluid interpretation, the symbolic interpretation of the grotesque could relate to uh, the Wizard of Oz, uh, which itself has been interpreted many, many different ways uh, symbolically. And the Wizard of Oz was written in 1900, just at the time when these grotesques were being carved from 1901 to 1903. And so with a lion and the ape and the flying monkeys and so forth, there have been illusions about that. We don't know. I'm, I noticed that one of the questions in the Q&A was, uh, uh, why haven't we checked the, uh, or, or have we thoroughly checked the uh, archives at KU? Well, we have, and, the, and there's a, um, uh, and there's nothing there, except for those two photographs, there's a letter um, about uh, the construction of the building and the carving of the building and how it will be paid for, uh, the carvings of the grotesques, and the fact that uh, Joseph Frazee was also hired to uh, produce all of the fabulous uh, animal Im imagery, animal and plant imagery uh, on the facade of the building, that we, do, we have no other information on what the grotesques uh, are intended to mean or what, their, what they symbolize. Um, we have a question here too about, uh, was there any discussion of recarving the other four and putting them on the back of the building? And someone else had a question, why did the west side of the building not have any? So um, yeah, maybe you could shed, shed some light on that. You know, I don't know. Again, there is nothing in the archives that could reveal uh, why the west side of the building uh, uh, doesn't have any, it's a great question. Um, and well, in order to have four on the west side, uh, I think that would be a lovely project. And, uh, and uh, it would, I can't think of anything more fitting than to have Carl and, and Laura carve four more grotesques. Uh, these will be easier to copy because they're in much better shape. They've had 50 years less of erosion uh, I don't know if they are, if, if the architects could put in the proper aedicules uh, on the west side to, uh, to mount them. Uh, but clearly the north, south, and east side were the ones that people would see walking up and down Jayhawk Boulevard, which is the grand front boulevard of the, of the campus. So that might be one reason why there were no grotesques on the west side. Um. Dina, uh, <clears throat> Dina posed a question and also says, congratulations to Carl and Laura on your amazing work. Carl, thanks for honoring your teacher, Eldon Teft. Do you two have any future sibling partner projects on the horizon? Um, and someone else also uh, mentioned um, 
that the originals were created with people who um, a father son and and um, yeah so um, yeah I think we we would like to continue I'm I'm ready to. I'm ready to go. I took a month off and I'm ready to go. <laughs> uh, you know, projects like this are, are sort of once in a lifetime. We have done other carbon projects together over the years and uh, sure things that come along are, are always exciting to see. Uh, you know, I know Laura has things going on, carvings that she has uh, coming up and and uh, I'm busy with uh, different different ones that are, are coming into my life, and uh, uh, we'll we'll see if if the things come together. Uh, one of the real joys is that uh, I'm here with my sister at the end of this project, and uh, it uh, is that was the goal is that we were still able to talk to each other at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, someone asked, can you talk a little bit more about the student involvement and what they contributed to the project? And I think um, it'd be great to hear from both both the architects and the artists uh, in this regard. I, uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, the KU Fine Arts Department, uh, Matt Burke and Tanya Hartman. Uh, they hired me uh, for two different semesters to be an, an instructor. And uh, I had students uh, come and, and what we, what I had them do was learn the use of the different tools on the grotesque. But then towards the end of the semester, I'd have them take the, those, uh, what they'd learn on, on utilizing the, the, the hand tools and and carved their own pieces. But, but what I would say in their design of their pieces that it had to be inspired by the building itself. And, uh, and I just had just some wonderful, wonderful students. I also have a, a number of private students that, uh, that helped me on this project. And uh, they, uh, they were instrumental in, in making, making it go smoothly for me. Uh, one, of, one of them for sure was uh, younger than I, I am and, and uh, brought that youthful energy into it. And uh, the students, more than anything, uh, gave me uh, a, a way to look at it that was uh, new eyes and, and uh, uh, I just, I can't, I can't thank them enough. They, they were just so delightful, including the students in Keith and Amy's uh, class. Yeah, so uh, Keith and I did a course together um, that was part of the School of Architecture. And I teach in the graduate certificate in historic preservation that we offer, which is soon also gonna be offered as an MA in historic preservation at KU in the School of Architecture. So we created this workshop that the students uh, that joined the course, their role was really about documenting the existing grotesque and then transforming them into maquettes that we could then give to Carl and Laura to do their work. And also a lot about the class was understanding the relationship of what an architect is supposed to do to help someone of extremely high craft do their job and help them and facilitate that um, and, and see how a project is, is performed more or less. So that was a lot of the, the class was having this relationship and showing how architects have a relationship with um, the, the masons and stone carvers and things like that, the craftspeople that work on projects. Um, so what the students did is they, we went and documented the grotesque by using photogrammetry, which is uh, basically like taking a lot of pictures all the way around it. And then we use this sort of program that puts all the pictures together and creates a digital 3D model. Um, so it's like magic, this 3D model appears. Um, and then we 3D printed it uh, with PLA. Um, and then we have like a little mini version of it. Um, and that's basically what the maquette is sort of the, the backbone, the, it's like a, almost like a, a framework of what the, the sculptors can then work with. Um, yeah, I mean, like 
Carl, I'm just glad that Amy and I were able to communicate after the project as well. But <laughs> I think uh, way back at the beginning of this project, you know, they they put out a call for proposals, and this was something. It was a competitive bid project, which made it really interesting to bring an educational dimension to it. And Carl uh, had been involved in some prior studios uh, with some of my students, and and we had kind of a relationship with stone carving and and how to integrated into the educational environment. And we came up with the idea to add this educational component to our proposal, which we hoped would both bring value to the proposal, that it would have an added dimension to the proposal, and then also extend the reach of this project into the community and into KU as a whole. Um, and then we just started brainstorming about how it could pair with the preservation certificate and how we could actually carry this out. And then it became much more of the collaboration that Amy was describing. And so um, from my understanding from Chris, we, we were the only ones that had a proposal that did anything besides just remake the stones. And we also had these great community uh, components that they were very excited about. And so it really uh, made for a nice story and, and a very uh, interesting proposal. It was a winning proposal many, in many ways. The, um, uh, the proposal, the artistry, uh, the involvement of the students, and the fact that it was based at KU was just uh, the winning trifecta. Uh, Louis asks, um, when will the new ones be placed, uh, uh, be installed? And I- I think you need to answer that. I, know. <laughs> I, think, I think we're not sure yet. We are um, excited um, to have a new uh, grotesque exhibit installed um, by early March or by the beginning of March. And hopefully our doors will be open then. And we really are excited uh, for the public to be able to see these up close. Uh, also, installing them is a bit of a, a, a bit of a project. I'm sure um, Keith and Amy and, and Carl and Laura might be able to speak a little bit more to this, uh, or Amy and Keith, if you were there when the uh, originals were taken down, it's, it's quite, uh, quite an experience. And uh, the weather has to be the right time of the season depends on the ground, um, uh, the sturdiness and uh, dampness of the earth to get a crane up there and things like that. So it'll be a while. So you should have plenty of time to come into the museum um, at some point this year and um, get them up. And when we are gonna put them up on the building, we will definitely let everybody know because it'll, it'll, we'll be very excited to, to see that happen. I think like the Jayhawks on parade, maybe they'll roam around town for a little while or something. Maybe. <laughs> no? Um, also, a lot of people have asked us about: Are we going to recreate the maquettes, or or um, do you know some sort of um, fundraise, you know, uh, models for for sale? And at this point, we don't have plans to do that. We have looked into the cost of something like that, and uh, at the, at this point, we're not we're not planning to do that. But we do have some awesome uh, grotesque magnets for sale in the museum. So when we're back open. Um, oh, Carl is this little one. <laughs> and, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I believe before I believe we started carving uh, in December of 2018, <laughs> there was a uh, uh, members' dinner, and Laura and I gave a talk, and Keith and Amy gave a talk. And at the end of Keith and Amy's talk, they handed out these things. <laughs> and what they are, are miniature grotesques. They took a 3D model and made a mold, and it's white chocolate. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a chocolate mold, <laughs> if anyone wants that. <laughs> I made. We'll call you, Amy. They need to put in the gift store, because that's what will sell. Everybody wants white chocolate. I buy that. You've yeah. been holding that for two years to bite that head <laughs> off at this meeting, haven't you? <laughs> so uh, while I'm going to use this opportunity, it's a great segue. Um, uh, while we were talking about funds and fundraising, um, is that this project could not have occurred without the fabulous friends of the museum uh, in the community and, and nationwide. Uh, many of you uh, contributed to the grotesque renewal uh, fundraising 
And especially, I want to give a shout out to the five families who adopted uh, the grotesques, uh, Muff and John Kelly, uh, Jan and Tom Rudkin, Cheryl Frazee and Aaron Wood, uh, Jeff and Mary Weinberg, and Linda Zarda Cook and John Cook, who adopted four of them. Uh, bravo to all of you for, and all of you who sent uh, uh, funds to uh, support this project to make it all possible. Thank you, absolutely. And um, we also wanna thank all of our campus partners too. Um, there were quite a few um, people that helped along along the way and helped us um, document it uh, uh, and, and more. Um, do we have time for a couple more questions before we close? Um, we have one here. Did either of you, uh, for Laura and Carl, did either of you receive messages or communication from the original sculptors? <laughs> Uh, if so, please describe any experiences. Thank you. And props to KU for not casting these in concrete. Um, I, I kind of thought of um, Joseph Frazee and his son. And I thought about how um, I, when I came to KU, I studied art, but I also studied dance. And um, so I was feeling a little bit like the choreography isn't mine, but I am interpreting this choreography. So um, yeah, that's, there was some communication uh, that way on, a, on that level. and. Uh, yeah, every every once in a while I'd, you know, say, I hope this is okay. You know. <laughs> Don't get mad, I'm doing my best. For me, it's goes back to thanking my teachers. Um, and I'd like to thank them individually. Uh, Keith Middlemass for sure, without his uh, encouragement from years and years ago, uh, I wouldn't be here today. Uh, he, he brought me into the world of stones and continues to answer my questions. And uh, luckily we don't end up in the ditch of life uh, as nearly as often as we did in the old days. Um, then uh, my years and years of working with Eldon Teft, uh, I can't, begin to tell you how much I thought about uh, Eldon while I was working on these, that uh, he, he uh, gave me uh, so many wonderful uh, experiences uh, in carving. But then th there were also Frazee himself. I, I would, when I would be on my way walking up to uh, the KU uh, foundry to go work with Eldon, I'd always stop at that museum and, uh, and look at those carvings. And, and just, how did he do that? How did he do that? How deep did he go here? How did, how did he make that? And Frazee, I, I feel, was, was one of my teachers. The other teacher that I truly want to thank and I learned so much from is this girl right here. That uh, she, uh, she got me going on doing sculpture uh, so many years ago. And uh, this project, I learned so much of uh, what it takes to do such beautiful work. And someone had asked if you if you all influenced each other while you were doing it, and also if uh, you had dreams about it while you were working on these. <laughs> Does this girl have dreams? <laughs> oh, yeah. um, I would say I, I would say that I would be in a dreamy place while I was working. 
And, um, and yeah, I would be thinking a lot about the meaning of what I was making. And um, I, I could talk about that, but I don't, we don't have that much time. And uh, as far as, yeah, I've, I've had some dreams where my, about my sculptures and it's pretty interesting. They'll talk to me and I would ask chase Laura, me around. I would ask Laura when she's getting ready to start on the next one. I go, well, you got any dreams yet? <laughs> and uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no, you know, yeah. sometimes yeah. Yeah, it's good. It's good when you when you're dreaming about work. It means you're sleeping. It's good. <laughs> uh, someone's asked, um, "How did you feel at the at the start of this huge project?" Um, <laughs> I made a poster for myself, and it had um, it was three things. At the top was work. Over here was recover, and then over here was prepare, and that's all I did. I'd work, and then I'd recover, and then I'd prepare, and then I'd work, recover, and um, I, I needed that. I needed that because it was such a big and a long project. And I needed to pace myself. I also needed to protect myself. I wasn't going to put myself out on Jayhawk Avenue and stop and talk to people. <laughs> I can't. I needed to focus. And um, I was taking a walk out in my woods and a couple years ago and, and um, came across some badger tracks. And I thought, that's my animal for this project. I'm going to be a badger. So I hadn't heard that one. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a stone biter. Okay. <laughs> for me, uh, the beginning of the project, I was just so thrilled to be working there. And uh, it, took, it took the first couple to understand how far I was supposed to take them. And like the first one, you know, because I didn't know for sure how far I was supposed to take it, I didn't take it nearly far enough. <laughs> and Laura was a little overwhelmed because I didn't take it that far. Well, you know, that was just being, being cautious. And, uh, but then I, we got, both of us, we kind of got into a rhythm of, of the work. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, it was uh, being excited by, by the students uh, that I was teaching. And uh, it's, uh, it, it's all been just a, a real thrill uh, right from the start. Um, well, we should probably wrap up. Um, do you all, I want to thank everybody for, for coming tonight and ask if the artists and the architects and Dr. Kristalka have any final thoughts. Um, and we can't wait to uh, meet in person someday. And um, we look forward to um, the new exhibit, which will not just be the new grotesque, but will also showcase the process and um, some of the maquettes and drawings and things like that, that, that were part of this whole process. So any, any final thoughts from you all? It's been a pleasure and an honor. Yeah. Thanks to everybody. And thank you, Carl like and uh, Also thank is Keith and Amy. It, it was just <laughs> such a like to work with these people and and made the project much more interesting but also i want to thank everybody at the museum yeah. from the director all the way down all the way through everybody that we dealt with there at the museum was so supportive and and uh also you know there were other 
KU and KU Endowment, uh, people that were supportive of this. And, uh, you know, I can't thank enough the, the donors and all the members of the museum that keep the place alive. And there, there, are so, there is so much going on at that place. And just seeing uh, what a dynamic uh, place it is. It, it's not just stuffed animals. It, there are some uh, very interesting uh, projects <laughs> at that place at, at any one time. But thank you to all, all the people that we've worked with. Well, I want to thank the artists, Laura and Carl. Uh, you were brilliant. And it was such an honor and privilege to work with you. And I hope to continue working with you. And Amy and Keith, uh, you're fabulous. Um, I am going to throw out one idea. And, uh, and I think this relates to some of the questions we've been asked. What do the grotesques mean? How do they speak to us? I think um, down the road, here's an opportunity for a terrific interdisciplinary study from either graduate students, undergraduates, uh, faculty members on uh, what do the grotesques mean? What do the old ones mean? What do the new ones mean? Uh, from an artistic point of view, historic point of view, architectural, mythological, psychological, philosophical, literary, here's a chance I think for a true interdisciplinary um, uh, study to be done by uh, a, a terrific team of students and faculty. All right, uh, gosh, well, thank you to everyone. Thank you to um, all the public that came and uh, for your support and um, we will see you soon and we will let you know, we'll be shouting it from our rooftops as soon as we can open our doors. I wanna thank um, Dr. Kristalka, Keith and Amy Vanderreet and Laura and Carl Ramberg. Um, thank you so much for your vision and artistry tonight. Cheers. Cheers. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you.